What is going on guys? Welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. And in today's Kerbal Space Program video, we're going to be building a space station with two contra-rotating artificial gravity rings. You may recall a video I did not that long ago actually, where we built a station of a similar kind of function and purpose, but I wanted to improve on that in a couple of ways. First of all, this one is going to be much, much bigger, which already makes it much better. The other thing is that we're not just going to be sticking this in low carbon orbit. No, no, no. We're going to be taking this thing all the way to MUN orbit. So very, very big payload, very, very awkwardly sized payload, and, you know, a somewhat far destination to get it to. So that's going to be the challenges we address. One of the reasons I wanted to build another ring station though is because one of my Discord server members showed me this cool sandwich trick that you can do. So conventionally in Kerbal Space Program all you can do is up to eight way symmetry. However what you can do is do this little exploit that lets you stack symmetry. So what I'm doing is I'm starting off with six octagonal struts placed around the rotor here. Then I'm making another piece with six-way symmetry around that. Then I'm placing it on the edges of those parts. Now if we just alt-click one of those periphery placed parts, we can then place it on the rotor with 36-way symmetry. I don't know how good of an explanation that was, but I think the video kind of shows you how to do it. So basically you can do six-way symmetry once, then place something which itself has six-way symmetry attached to them, and then you can place one of the outer six-way symmetry pieces onto the center of the whole structure, and that then does 6 times 6, 36-way symmetry. And you can do that as many times as you want. Like You can get kind of 8 by 8 symmetry. Uh, I don't know what the actual maximum maximum of this is, but you can get some pretty big structures. And as you can see, it makes the construction of circular things, like a gravity ring, an absolute breeze, as is the case, <laughs> as is the actual process of strutting it all together. Normally, you need to do lots of individual strutting, but here, you just place one strut, and it just duplicates it 36 times. Thank you very much, Melon Usk, Usk, Milon Usk. I'm not sure how you meant to pronounce that name, but I put a, I would have put a thing on screen to show you what that guy's picture looks like. Thank you. I mean, you might not have been the one, you might not have been the one that discovered this, but I'm. This is you introduced this to me, so that's who I'm crediting. And obviously, take a look at the date of this video. I'm recording this on the 27th of November. It worked like now, but this might get patched out later on. So you have been warned. This may not be a relevant video for very long. Now what I'm doing is just, you know, adding the little sort of finishing to I mean, this whole station is a complete waste of time. Let's face it, space stations and Kerbal Space Program serve very little purpose. All you need is a mobile processing lab and some experiments, and that's all you need for a space station. But it's nice to just kind of make something that looks pretty cool. And, you know, it's it, gravity rings, they look pretty cool. And they do serve a purpose. One of the other things, I, I mentioned there have been a couple of reasons why I wanted to redo the artificial gravity station. The other thing was that I actually took the time to take that station's kind of statistics and make it so it would have a realistic spin speed in order to generate a 1G of a centripetal acceleration in the ring itself. So effectively, the gravity would be the same as on Kerbin. However, I boldly assumed that KSP rotors could be set to any RPM you want. So I was like, oh, they need to be set to this RPM. However, they can't. They can only be set to RPMs that are divisible by five, I think. So my old space station's radius, I think, I'm now going from memory, was about six meters, uh, which means that the actual uh, spin speed, as in the angular velocity, would have had to have been 12.2. Uh, rotations per minute, which, you know, rotors in KSP can't do. But by having a radius of 10, our angular velocity only needs to be 9.5, so that's close enough to 10 for my liking. Now, granted, if we were going for a super realistic, uh, for at least for a human space program, it's still probably not quite there. Whilst the centripetal acceleration is 1G with this space station provided we go, we follow through with setting the rotors to have a RPM of nine of, of 10, but, you know, there are certain things like the radius is probably still a little bit too small, like the actual disparity between the speed that your feet are spinning at versus the speed your head is spinning at. Probably not quite enough uh, for you to not dis experience a lot of discomfort. Ideally, the radius needs to be much, much bigger. Now, I'm pulling all these statistics from a great website called SpinCalc. I'm going to put a link in the description, but it's basically a very niche online tool that lets you calculate how big your gravity ring needs to be and what kind of speed it needs to spin out in order to get any kind of desired output, whether or not you want to aim for a specific radius size or, you know, attain a perfect human environment, which 
this space station isn't, you know, it's far too small really to achieve that. If you'd like to read into this, it's in the description and it also gives you nice criticisms as well. So it says for mine, whilst the centripetal acceleration, i.e. the gravity in the ring, is perfect, the tangential velocity is too low for comfort, the angular velocity is too high for comfort, and the actual radius itself, like I said, is, is too low. And it kind of links studies and explains why this is the case. I'm going to put a link in the description. I've already talked about this calculator in the last artificial ring station video, so I'm not going to delve into it too much. What I will delve into is what I'm doing here. So you can see I've added this girder piece kind of scaffolding extending all the way along the spine of the space station. The reason that's there is so I can strut the ring to those girders and keep the whole thing in place so it won't just freely rotate upon launch and risk, uh, <laughs> greatly increase our uh, susceptibility to crack and attacks and also just, you know, generally make the station very unstable. The reason I can't strut the rings to the station body itself is because once I fire up the rotors, those struts won't disappear. They're not like decouplers or... I don't know, separatrons or anything like that, they will always be there regardless of where the rotors are turning. So if you've got the struts there holding the rings to the station body, when you fire the rotors, nothing will happen. So you kind of have to have it strutted to things that you can just detach by decouplers because once it detaches by decoupler, the strut will disappear. So I've strutted them all to that scaffolding that is all part of the lower stage that we're going to be getting rid of. And, you know, it's good to kind of just test this throughout the flight because, as I learned the hard way in my previous artificial gravity ring station, uh, sometimes the Kraken can just change what struts are attached to and renders your whole mission useless. So be very, very liberal with the, with the quick save function, ladies and gentlemen. The actual lifter itself is nothing to write home about, really. It's just a, I don't know, a Saturn V heavy heavy. Like, it's like a bigger version of a Saturn V with two Saturn Vs alongside it. It's 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 a bit it's it's a real potch potch build. It's not something I'm that proud of. It just does. It just works. Just gets the job done. The upper stage is very very big because it's got a big burn to do. It's got to get from low Kerbin. Well, first of all, it's got to circularize at Kerbin, and then it's got to haul this massive station from low Kerbin orbit all the way up to a circular orbit around Mun, and then it needs to have enough fuel left over to then deorbit itself and not leave any debris in space. That's what I'm doing here, adding a probe core and SAS unit, batteries, and means of regenerating those batteries, just so again we can clear this debris away from the station and not leave it just stuck floating in space. Now as for the crew, we're going to break out the old crew from the Soviet Skylon mission. This is going to be where my Discord server staff live. Um, I have banished them from the planet. This now doesn't seem like a great reward, but you know, I thought they would prefer to live in space. Sorry guys, if you didn't, it's, no, it's just done. The, the deed is done. And they are now off on their way. So obviously I'm there as well. I'm there to provide support, I guess. Uh, so we're all we're all in this together now. To the very bitter end, guys. Anyway, here we are launching. Not a not a very exciting launch, honestly. Uh, we're just going through the beats. If you don't, I'll put a link to this craft in the description. One thing you should do before you launch, if it doesn't do it by default, is just press Action Group One. That just sets that top cupola module to be the control point of the craft. Because for me, at least, whenever I launched it, I think it's because of the way the root part was set up. Whenever I launched it. The control point was a module that was facing downwards, which makes the whole thing uncontrollable. So just make sure your control point is the top cupola module, either by using Ash Group 1 or just, you know, right clicking the cupola module and pressing control from here. But look at that, reaching our 10 kilometer mark. I'm going for a kind of less aggressive gravity turn than I normally do. I'm trying to be keeping the uh, all our movements as slow and conservative as we possibly can because I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but this is a very. Uh, just, it's, such a, it's such a big payload and very, very unstable. So you've got to be very careful during our flight. But you can see we have now cleared our way through the cloud layer, which is finally looking good again because I've updated my visual mods. I believe I'm using environmental or visual enhancements, but using the actual uh, textures from stock visual enhancements. We've also got Planet Shine and Scatterer here as well. Just kind of add some extra nice aesthetics to the game. And there go the lower boosters. You can see I use one of the, some of the new SRBs from KSP 1.8 more boosters to help facilitate their detachment. It looks a little bit more impressive than just using a, a load of Separatron boosters. In hindsight, I probably should have removed most of the solid fuel because as you can see, those separating boosters continued burning for quite some time. But at least, hey, it looked pretty cool just as a visual spectacle. And this video is I guess this video by definition is a visual spectacle some might disagree but it's a visual thing 
Anyway, let's move on to a different part of... Let's just, just change the topic. What I'm doing now is I'm still holding a fairly v kind of aggressive uh, vector at this point because I was trying to gain as much altitude as possible using the high thrust Mastodon engine stage, which is now detached. I wanted to try and gain as much altitude as possible because I wanted to give the Rhino stage as much opportunity as possible to actually circularize at Kerbin. Uh, and it's going to be, it's going to operate the best when it's out of the atmosphere completely where drag is, you know, nil. As you can see, whilst we are still accelerating, our actual acceleration rate has taken somewhat of a dip um, in terms of its actual speed. It's going to take us a while to reach the orbital velocity of 2,300 meters per second. I think I, think I was... I think I started pointing relatively flat here, somewhat optimistically. I probably should have maintained a much steeper trajectory a little bit longer, just because now what we're doing is we're reaching our apoapsis point, and we're going to start falling away from apoapsis again. I didn't want this to happen, or at least it was going to happen, but I didn't want this to happen to the point where we would start re-entering Kerbin's atmosphere, which unfortunately we did. So I probably should have continued burning earlier at 45 degrees a little bit longer just to ensure that we'd have enough opportunity to complete our circularization burn before we reached Kerbin's atmospheric line again. But we don't enter the atmosphere for very long and we don't end up like very significantly. I think the lowest we ever get is like 67 kilometers, which is not very deep into the atmosphere. For all intents and purposes, it's still space. You know, I mean, in real life, there is no real definitive, like, definite point at which the atmosphere ends and space begins. You could say it's the Kármán line that is the official kind of designated point at which space begins, but really, the atmosphere tapers off gradually. Uh, granted, Kerbal Space Program is a video game, so they can be a bit more mathematically precise with how things work, but the drag at, come on, the drag at, like, 68 kilometers is going to be insignificant. Uh, and there we are, 69 kilometers, very nice. That was a joke not intended for children because my target audience... And now we're back in space. So it was, it wasn't a big problem overall. It was, it was, it was fine, guys. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. I'm a rocket scientist. <laughs> Anyway, what we need to do now is complete the final stage of our orbital insertion, which is, I guess, to do our actual circularization burn, which, because we spent so long <laughs> burning just then, we only have to do a mere 18 meter per second burn just under in order to achieve a stable Kerbin orbit. And then we can start plotting the next phase of this mission, which is getting ourselves from low Kerbin orbit all the way to, I guess, Mun orbit. So looking at the screen there, it seems that we have 1,289 meters per second of delta v remaining which is about 200 meters per second more than what i intend us to need i always i usually say that i like to budget a little bit of extra delta v into my missions for just you know in case of any unforeseen circumstances such as accidentally entering Kerbin's atmosphere during our circularization burn but another key reason i wanted to have a bit of extra delta v is because i wanted to actually have enough fuel in the booster to take the booster away and pilot it and deorbit it and not leave it stuck in orbit, as I said earlier. But I kind of wanted to crash it back into Kerbin rather than leave it on the Mun, because by crashing it into Kerbin, we'll be actually, you know, we'll be ensuring that it definitely gets destroyed on re-entry. Sometimes crashing stuff onto the Mun, uh, these girder pieces are very resilient, they might survive, and I don't really want to leave any contaminating stuff on the Mun, uh, as much as I do, as much as I don't want to leave stuff in space either. What I did there, I didn't talk about any of it because I'm great at commentaries, uh, I made a quick save, called it test, just to make sure that the rings would work once we detached the girder section, I hadn't accidentally strutted things incorrectly or the Kraken hadn't reconfigured my strut work. So I did a quick save, detached the lower stage, just make sure the rings spun up, and they did. So we can go ahead and proceed with the rest of the mission. I guess I could talk about one thing which I never mentioned. Well, a couple of things, I guess, about the design of the mission. Because I get you guys probably have seen me go to the Mun, or other YouTubers, or you yourself have been to the Mun before. You probably know how this goes now. Uh, a couple of design points which I did touch upon, granted, in my previous Artificial Gravity Station video, but you guys might not have seen it. Uh, I've got two rings here for the, re the reason for the... Well, the reason I've got two rings is because... Sorry, I got really distracted just then because Malwarebytes suddenly popped up saying there's a new version ready to be installed. Like, I get it, Malwarebytes. And anyway... Regardless, I probably should edit this out, but I'm going to continue anyway. The reason I've got two rings is because one will spin clockwise, one will spin counterclockwise. If we just had the one ring, the torque that that ring kind of generates would end up rotating the body of the space station itself. So there is, the space station will spin one way, the ring will spin the other. We don't want that because we want the core of the station to remain, you know, stationary because it's it would just be very, very nauseating for the crew. It's not ideal. So we want the core to stay stationary. 
So we can do this either by sticking loads and loads of SAS modules onto it, which would create a huge power draw and it's not really practical, or we could just stick another ring that rotates the opposite way, and that kind of basically cancels out the rotating effects of the other rings. They cancel each other out, leaving the core of the station intact and not rotating. Now granted, there is still a little bit of rotational influence on the core of the station, and that's why we've stuck a few SAS units on it, just to keep it under control during the spinning of the rings. Although I found that I actually didn't always need to have SAS enabled. Just sometimes, for whatever reason, it would start to just wobble a little bit, so you can just hit AS, SAS by pressing T, obviously, and those, control, those SAS units keep the thing under control. We don't have any solar panels, but I made sure that our actual... Um, power generation capacity through the RTGs, I've got stashed aboard this thing, uh, is sufficient so that, you know, we're never going to lose power during the station's operation. The rate at which the RTGs recharge the batteries is quick enough to keep up with the power draw needs of the station. I feel like that was a really difficult sentence to string together in my mind, as I said it, but I think I got the message across. Hopefully you guys get it. Anyway, here we are arriving at the Mun, moving swiftly on once again. Uh, I've created a maneuver node to basically lower our apoapsis to get ourselves into a roughly circular orbit. I kind of wanted to get a perfectly circular orbit for this thing, so I ended up doing some fine tuning once we got our initial initial circularization down, but this is pretty much it. And then we can start thinking about, obviously, firing up the station's rings and getting the booster stage back to Kerbin where we can destroy it and make sure that all the space dolphins don't end up accidentally eating up rocket parts rather than, you know, their natural food source, which is space mackerel. And it's only mackerel. Mackerel's the only fish that adapted to space. It's really weird, that. <sighs> what am I talking about? Anyway, let's just continue on with <laughs> the conversation. So, yep, so I went with a periapsis height of 120 thousand me I was about to say 120 meters that would have been a very audacious <laughs> orbital height no 120 kilometers above the surface of the moon just because that seemed like a nice round number and uh, then we can just get our apoapsis to be the same sort of height I was gonna bother I wouldn't do, I wasn't too worried about getting it exactly dead on exactly the same as long as they're you know saying 120 kilometers I'm not too worried about and uh, the odd meter here or there as uh, in addition to this when we detach the lower stage that's going to influence the orbit a little bit even if I got the thing perfect perfectly circular it would get ruined when i actually detached this de detached this lower booster which we've now done and as you can see it effortlessly separates from the station nothing got destroyed which is always a good a sign of good things in Kerbal Space Program. And then we can fire up action group 6 i believe i bound it to to fire up those rings and as you can see by having them rotate Con well, having them rotate op opposite directions, the station core stays stationary. And you may have noticed, actually, I disabled SAS for that clip just there. And the whole thing was still remaining, you know, rock steady, not spinning or anything like that. So mission successful so far. We still need to, you can see, we, you can just see we've left physics range now because the rings have stopped spinning. We can go ahead and deorbit at this booster here. So... There's not really much to say at all, to be honest. It's just performing a burn to escape from the Mun, and then we'll do a quick uh, retrograde burn once we've left the Mun's sphere of influence to make sure our orbital line definitely uh, infiltrates Kerbin's atmosphere steep enough that the re-entry heating will sufficiently destroy this rocket. I'm pretty sure the girders actually survive, because again, those girder pieces are very, very hardy, but they don't survive impact onto Kerbin. Spoiler alert! Uh, I, I guess you guys were all on the edge of your seat waiting to see what happens. I've just ruined that suspension for you. I hope you have it in your heart to forgive me. Anyway, yeah, I mean, I guess I could talk about kind of what drove me to build this station. I mean, I've already given you kind of adequate points as to why I wanted to redo the artificial gravity station, but make it a little bit cooler. Uh, but one of the main reasons I wanted to stick... Oh, there goes... The <laughs> There's the fireworks, by the way. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to put it in orbit around Mun, rather than, say, somewhere like Juno or Minmus, is because I kind of... I've always talked about this. Well, I've not always talked about it, but I've talked about it a lot in previous videos, about maybe doing a soft recreation of the hypothetical Lockheed Mars Martian program, and Lockheed Martian is obviously a, <laughs> wait for the splash, is obviously the colloquial name for it. It's Lockheed Martin's plan for a uh, Mars, ex I was about to say Juno, a Mars expedition in real life. So it involves setting up a space station around Mars, building these like ascension modules that can go to and from the surface, deploy science equipment. It might be a cool little mini series. I know, well, Matt Lowndes thinking about doing another series. How long till he abandons this one? Okay, it was only Life on Lake, I think, that got abandoned. <laughs> uh, and Game of Drones. Old school viewers of my channel may remember Game of Drones. It, I released it in like, I don't know, September 2015. 
and it was one episode long and it was basically the idea i've completely changed the topic haven't i i was gonna unlock the entire tech tree only using robot parts uh so you can't get surface samples you can't plant flags you can't do any kind of high yielding experiments you can only kind of use robotic parts which kind of sounded cool just because it was a cool name uh, but it turned out it's actually quite boring to not be able to do any, anything on EVA, so I quickly abandoned that. By the way, I'm now going to... That was that. I'm ending that topic. I'm going to talk about it here quickly. You've seen me spin this thing up at, you know, a sensible RPM, but I thought you might want to see what it looks like when taken to its fastest speed. I thought I'd do some epic stunt EVA, see if we can get through these rings without hitting them. Uh, did It didn't go very well, and I think Matt Kerman's death awoke the Kraken... And he decided to smite the rest of the station, as you can see here. It's going, it's going, it's going, it's gone. It's gone. It's all, it's all gone. Another set of fireworks for you guys. Uh, anyway, no, Lockheed Martian. Uh, so it involves all those components that I just said. But one of the key components is that it involves something called the Deep Space Gateway, which is a space station around the Mun. So I thought, and that would be constructed with SLS and Orion and all that. However, I've already done a Deep Space, a Deep, a Deep space gateway video in which we construct it using sls and orion modules and i didn't really want to just rehash it but i don't have that save file anymore or at least i've now retired that save file and don't want to go back to it so if we're going to be thinking if i'm seriously thinking about doing a lockheed martian either recreation or you know my interpretation of the lockheed martian program then we should probably have some kind of mun space station so let's just do Let's just do something crazy. So I decided to do gravity rings because it looks cool. We've already done and what a proper deep space gateway recreation would be. Let's just go bonkers. And I do I, I do like just building big space stations in this game because I know there's something quite therapeutic about just playing around with the offset tool for ages in the space plane hangar and getting everything tweaked just right, just right. And uh, then launching it all and seeing uh, you get you end up with a nice thing. To look at like the disappointing thing about big things like eve missions is you have this big intricately designed rocket it's really impressive but then when the mission's over you just have a command pod left whereas space stations you have this and it's going to serve as the new base of operations for the matt Lown discord server so good luck ddosing us now guys uh this is it this is the new location of the server staff whether or whether they like it or not this is their home now this is your life now guys uh, and with that i'm just going to end the video there uh, on screen there are links to things on the left hand side is just a video chosen for you by youtube's recommendation algorithm uh, and the one on the right is actually no, let's all say my most recent upload let's say it's the old artificial gravity ring station so you can compare and contrast anyway I'm going to leave it there. There's links to other things on screen and in the description. You can probably see that for yourself. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.